Katya's invitation. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, some recent studies for some simultaneous recovery inverse problems for nonlinear uh, equations. In fact, I will just uh, focus on the nonlinear parts and the non-local parts will be just uh, very roughly discussing discussion a bit. Okay, so yep. So this talk is mainly based on the joint works with uh, Mati, Hong Yu Liu, Xu uh, Liu, Tony, Miko, and uh, Johnson. And uh, he's a new PhD student of Hong Yu Liu. So he's just the first year, I think, if I have a good memory. So anyways, let's start. And uh, today my online will be uh, separated into the four parts. The, the first part is uh, just a, a very quick review of the unique determination inverse problems. And uh, the second part, we'll talk about the, the technique to solve some nonlinear version. In fact, it's just semi-linear version inverse problems. And the, the third part will be a simultaneous recovery for semi-linear parabolic equation. And the last part will be the semi-linear hyperbolic equations. Okay. So the first part is unique determination problems. So I think uh, everyone is very familiar with the is, is very, very familiar with the Keton problem. So I just started from the Keton problem for the Schrodinger equation, and for the local case and the linear case. So for example, like uh, consider the potential Q is just a bounded potential, and uh, we consider the Dirichlet problem like uh, minus one plus plus Q V equal to zero, and the V equal to F on the boundary. And everyone knows this is well posed if we avoid zero to be the Dirichlet eigenvalue for the minus Laplace plus Q. So after this, we can define the corresponding Dirichlet Neumann map. Uh, and in short, I will just uh, say this will be the DM map in the rest of this talk. And the DM map is defined by the Dirichlet data to the Neumann data. So <clears throat> by knowing the Dirichlet Neumann map lambda Q, this is the inverse problem. So for the forward problem, of course, everyone knows if Q is known and F is known, then we can try to solve V uh, theoretically by Luxembourg brain or something. But uh, for the inverse problem side, we want to find the potential Q, which is a coefficient by knowing the Dirichlet Neumann map. So how to solve this? And uh, everyone is uh, very familiar just uh, by using the integration with parts and uh, which is called the uh, Alexandrini identity. So two DM maps are equal, then we have the integral in, integral identity like this, integral omega q1 minus q2, u1, u2 equal to zero. And then this u1, u2 are the solution to the Schrodinger equation. And the, the main task to solve, the main method to solve this problem to determine q1 to equal to q2, we only need to prove q1 minus q2 equal to zero. So which is u1 product of u2 is just a dense subset in L1. So how to achieve this one? Then we just, uh, not adjust. In fact, this is not a simple. Of course, the problem already develop, developed for 40 years. So everyone now is, is, uh, know how to solve this problem. But the idea comes from very earlier uh, idea from the Kedron. So for, for the Kedron exponential solutions, he found like for the harmonic function, you can find the exponential solution with complex vectors. And uh, this complex vector in the product itself equal to zero. So this will be the exponential solution. And uh, for the Schrodinger equation, we can find the so-called complex geometrical optic solution and by Sylvester and the woman in 1987. And uh, of course you have uh, some condition on this first leading order term, which is the vector law and the inner product with the gradient A equal to zero. And the, the R is stand for the remainder term. And the remaining term will tend to zero in the L2 sense as the parameter low vector goes to infinity. So they prove the paper in NOS. If you have lambda Q1 equal to lambda Q2, then you have a Q1 equal to Q2 by using such kind of solutions. So I think everyone is familiar with this one. So I just have very quick to review. So this is a unique, unique determination problem for the linear shorting equation. Okay, so now just turn to the semi-linear differential equation. So semi-linear differential equation comes from the motivation from the, for example, like a reaction diffusion equation. Of course, you can come from the hyperbolic equation or some other elliptic equations. 
And uh, anyways, so this type of equation just uh, arises in the model to, in the chemistry reaction and the population density or pendant formation. So different nonlinearity give you different uh, phenomena. So for example, like a feature chromograph or logistic diffusion equation with quadratic nonlinearity. So which means x w equal to some q of x multiplied with w square. So qx, qx is a coefficient in the, in the w term, in the solution term is w square. Or Neville Whitehead in the Siegel equation with a cubic nonlinearity. And of course, the um, I think the one of the hardest problem is the combustion for the exponential nonlinearity. And uh, I was trying to think this problem, but uh, I have no idea. So which means if we have a QX multiply with exponential something, and how do you solve the coefficient in front of the exponential nonlinearity? Uh, because it, it's, it's, uh, because in this problem, zero is not a trivial solution. So you need to find a, super, a suitable solution to do the linearization technique. And then we will see the how, how to do the linearized technique after uh, very, very soon. Okay. So based on this motivation, if we consider the stationary solution, so for uh, just like a WXT, which is in the independent of time variable. So just WXT equal to U of X and uh, consider the same linear elliptic equation, then we have uh, the Laplace u plus x u equal to zero, which is just elliptic. And this, this Dirich problem, just uh, uh, to say it's related to maintain the temperature inside the, of the region and the, for, the, <coughs> for the given boundary data f here. And the boundary measurements also can be proved if you can show the well positiveness. And that this well positiveness can be shown easily. I mean, uh, not so easy in, in the sense is like a, this is not a global well positiveness because it, we need to always assume the uh, uh, input boundary data to be small. And the idea comes from if we assume the x zero equals zero here, and the zero when the Dirich data f is zero here, then the plus zero plus x zero equal to zero. So the, and the u equal to zero on the boundary. So zero will be the trivial solution. And then you can do the some small perturbation around the zero by using implicit function theory to find the solution. And this is only can give you the local well positiveness by using the smallest data on the boundary. But it is enough because we didn't assume any uh, extra assumption on x u, only x zero equals zero here. So the, for the uh, input boundary input is sufficiently small, then we have a local well positiveness. Then by using the local oil positives, one can define the corresponding Dirich to Neumann map, and we call it lambda A, and the, from the Dirich data to the Neumann derivative on the boundary. So this is the equilibrium states across the boundary. And the, the inverse problem is, if we know the Dirich to Neumann map, lambda A, then we are trying to recover the coefficient A here. But this is a nonlinear non term, it's a nonlinear term. Okay, so this problem, in fact, is a quite a long time ago. So, what's the. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, here. So, some earlier work uh, by Ziki Sun and uh, Isakov, they already considered some kind of semi linear equation like this way a plus u plus x u equals zero in the bounded domain, bounded smooth domain omega. And the layer assume the condition like this, x zero equal to zero. And uh, the first derivative of x u, this is u, it's not zero, it's not a one point. This is the whole, whole line x u is equal to zero. And uh, then this lambda a, the DMF can determine the coefficient x u for all x uniquely. And uh, this is uh, based on the idea of, uh, to trace the information from the Linear equation to the nonlinear equation, and the, if you have a sign condition here, so if you do the first linearization, you have the linear equation, and this linear equation combined with this sign condition, you have the maximum principle. So you can have the uh, like a sub solution, sub solution, and then you can trace the solution by using the minimax or the parameter kind of things. Then you can trace the uniqueness uh, the results by using the linear technique. And this result was given by Isakov, Hyunbei, Genakamura, uh, Ziki Sun, and the Gunther for semi equations and under such kind of conditions, these two conditions. And uh, uh, in 2018, there's an invention, there was an invention paper by Kurilev, Philosophers, Woman, and they studied the inverse problem for the semi linear space time hyperbolic equations 
by using some different sources interaction phenomenon. Okay, so this problem is quite well, uh, quite well studied already. So what's the new? So the new part is about, if we consider very simple equation, little equation, like uh, as I said before, like this equation, uh, like this model, logistic equation or chromograph, if we have the quadratic term in the solution W here. So if the W squared, so W squared here, and the stationary will be U squared here. So if we just consider a super simple model like this, the plus U plus Q U squared equal to zero, it's a semi-linear equation with a quadratic linearity. And uh, we just assume Q belongs to C infinity omega bar. In fact, we only need a Q is in C alpha, some polar space. And uh, just we have the, some short estimates and the iteration, we can prove the real positiveness. But uh, for the simplicity, we just consider Q is uh, quite smooth. And uh, the dimension is uh, greater equal to two. So this semi-linear case is mean, uh, it's meaning for the case x u equal to q x u square. And uh, if, you if you differentiate with respect to u, so partial u x u will be two q x u. And uh, this term has no sign condition as the previous sign condition here, because they assume the sign condition here to prove the uh, uniqueness result, but uh, if you consider this kind of the nonlinearity, so Q is unknown, so of course U is unknown. And uh, you don't know the sign of Q, so of course you don't know the sign of U. So you, don't, you, cannot, and you cannot know the uh, sign condition of QX multiplied with U a priori. So we, we cannot have this term less equal to zero. So we, we cannot have the sign, such of a sign condition. So without the sign condition, how do we recover this Q? By using the same DMA plan Q. So this is a, a recent paper, recent, yeah, in, yeah kind of recent paper. Uh, we, um, Mati, Tony, myself, and Miko, we prove if Q, the potential is uh, smooth enough. As, as I said before, C alpha is enough, but uh, we just uh, put the C infinity uh, for the simplicity. And then the QJ be the DMA for the, this problem. And suppose we have the same DM map, lambda Q1F equal to lambda Q2F. And on the boundary for any sufficient small F, then we have a Q1 equal to Q2. And this sufficient small, because I said before, uh, this equation has well positiveness property for the just local well positiveness, not the global well positiveness. So we cannot put the F to be arbitrarily large. This need to be small. This is a very important thing here. So this is the main unique results in the same linear equation. Okay, and uh, so how to prove this one? How to prove this theorem? And I will talk about the proof and the idea here. So the idea is based on so-called higher order linearization. So this is the second part of my talk. So the higher order linearization in fact is quite all, um, how do I say? It's quite all simple in some sense, if you find the correct way to parameterize the equation. So of course, you just uh, consider, concentrate on the semi-linear equation, the plus u plus q u squared equals zero in omega, you get f on the boundary. And uh, we, oh, I always say this f to be small for the local positive property for this one. And the f is small, so we just introduce f as a two parameter, two small parameter f equal to epsilon one, f one plus epsilon two, f two. So for some small parameter, epsilon one, epsilon two, uh, more f the mod, because in small in the sense is the, in the positive sense, not negative sense, sorry. So this will be epsilon value here. And uh, because boundary data, f equal to epsilon f one plus epsilon two, f two, you have two parameters, extra parameters here. Then you just parameterize the solution uj in terms of x, but also with the boundary data epsilon and epsilon two due to oil positiveness, you have the uh, free, uh, C infinity free shear derivative uh, depends on the boundary data. So you can also parameterize the solution U in terms of X epsilon one, epsilon two. And the, by using this kind of the boundary data, then you just plug into the equation here. Then you have a Laplace UJ plus QJ UJ square equal to zero. And the UJ equal to epsilon F1 plus epsilon two F2 on the boundary omega. Then you just ignore all the x parameter here. You just regard the epsilon one, epsilon two as a new parameter, and that differentiate differentiates the equation 
with respect to epsilon one or epsilon two, either and, and the both. Then you differentiate, then you have uh, the Laplace partial partial epsilon one uj plus two qj. Here qj is uh, just depend on x variable. It has no epsilon variable here. But uh, if you differentiate with respect to the epsilon j, you have it here. So this is two uj and the partial epsilon uj equal to zero. And the partial partial epsilon l uj equal to fl. So for l equal to one or two. So l equal to one, here's one, here's one, here's one, so f1. So you can see F, epsilon two is uh, independent for epsilon two also similarly. So epsilon one and epsilon two independent, this, this term will be annihilated. So you have this simple, look, looks like a, some just differentiation equation. And the the benefit for this one? Here's a uj, so please keep in mind, here's the extra uj here. So this uj will help us how to, how to help. So if we plug epsilon one, epsilon two equals zero into the equation, into the, this equation, if we plug epsilon, epsilon one, epsilon two equals zero into this equation, then we have a Laplace first derivative x zero zero plus two q uj x zero zero and the uh, first derivative uj x zero zero equal to zero. But what is term uj? When uj x zero zero equal, uj x takes epsilon one and epsilon two equal to zero, then uj must be zero because uj is the solution for this one. So epsilon one, epsilon two equal to zero, which means the boundary data will be zero. So the well positions give you, when the boundary data is zero, the solution will be only trivial solution, which is zero. So when the parameter does vanish, then the solution vanish. Then this equation has no uh, has no QJ term because this turns zero, so this turns is is disappeared. It doesn't just disappeared. So we just have the Laplace something equal to zero, which is a harmonic function. So we denote the first derivative as a VJL, which is a harmonic function, and with the boundary data VJL equal to FL. And the VJL is a harmonic function, and with the boundary data. And uh, by unique of a Dirichlet problem, we have the uh, if we have a, a fixed l equal to one, then v one v sub one equal to v sub two l. So we have the v l equal to v sub one l equal to v sub two l in omega by the uniqueness of the boundary data for the harmonic functions. So this is uh, benefits to key of the unknown coefficient in the first linearization, and the then. After we do the second linearization and the repeat again, so we just do the linearize about this one, second derivative of this one. So one more epsilon one, epsilon one, then you do the epsilon two derivative. So you have a mixed term here. So the one mixed term is a two first derivative plus two twice derivative, but with one term no derivative, right? So you just do the twice derivative. So you have a uh, two first derivative multiplied together and the one no derivative with a twice derivative here. And then you take epsilon one, epsilon two equal to zero again, uh, but the boundary data will vanish because boundary only one epsilon parameters. So you, if you do second derivatives, then the boundary data will be zero for sure. And uh, if you plug in the epsilon one, epsilon two equal to zero, then this term will be zero. Will disappear because uj x zero zero equal to zero with a boundary zero and the solution zero. So this term disappear. So we only have a Laplace wj plus two qj v1 v2 equal to zero. But what is v1 v2? v1 v2 is comes from the first linear equation, which are harmonic functions. So you have a two harmonic functions multiplied together plus one Laplace with some wj is a second is a solution for the second linear equation. So the second linear equation will give you this one, quite a simple one. And if you, uh, and the wj is a second derivative here, partial square, partial epsilon, partial epsilon, uj, x, and, and the evaluates at x, epsilon one, epsilon two equals zero. So we end up with this equation. So what's the benefit we can see here? So after this, we just do the integration with parts. And uh, by using the same smallness data local wave positions with the DMF at the hand, we can have the Neumann derivative for the U1 at the same, and then you take twice derivative on both sides, then you will have the Neumann derivative for W1 and the W2. They are the same on the boundary. And then you just integrate 
you just subtract these two and then integrate. And the integration by parts will give you the Laplace W1 minus W2. But Laplace W1 is just the equation for the minus two Q1. Laplace W2 will give you the minus two Q2 here. So if you have the Laplace one minus Laplace W, uh, if you have a Laplace W1 minus Laplace W2, you will have a two integral of omega Q2 minus Q1, V1, V2 equal to zero. And this one equal to zero is another integral identity. But the layer product V1, V2 are harmonic functions. V1, V2 are defined by the this 2.3 is here. And the, this V1, V2 is nothing but a harmonic function. So the whole problem traces back to, you have a two difference potential multiplied with two harmonic functions. Can you prove Q1 U to Q2? And of course, yes, this is uh, just shown by the very early Cateron exponential solution. He considered exponential solution like this form and uh, have some uh, perpendicular condition here, orthogonal condition and the, the length are the same. And then if you plug in these two Cateron, so Cateron type solutions, Cateron exponential solutions, and the K and the minus K will, will cancel out and then you will just end up with two I C dot X. And then you have the free transform of the Q1 minus Q2 is it zero. So of course Q1 equal to Q2. And based on this formula, based on this simple formula, if you have the, if you have the boundary data here, it's not zero. And you can have a reconstruction formula, just one line like this. Just the potential after free transform at the minus two C here. This is a two I C dot X. So which means minus two, uh, minus two, minus I minus two C dot X. So this is a Fourier transform evaluates as a minus two C. Then we'll give you this one, just simple reconstruction formula for the this simple equation. And uh, this, <coughs> this reconstruction formula just uh, give you the Fourier transform for the Q hat Q. And then uh, you just do the uh, inverse Fourier transform and you can reconstruct the Q potential here for this one. So you can see this reconstruction form formula is much simpler than the, if you don't have a power here. If you just consider the plus U plus Q U equals zero and the, the reconstruction formula cannot be this simple. So in fact, uh, the nonlinear non problem looks like uh, we'll give you the formula and the uh, inverse problem become much simpler in, in some sense. So at, at least in this sense, we have a simpler reconstruction formula and a simple unique, uniqueness, form, uniqueness results by using two harmonic functions. So this is a technique for the second order generation. So if you want to recover cubic, for example, here Q3, you just introduce the three parameters and then you will end up with the three harmonic functions together. And this is, this is the equation. So you just choose two harmonic functions to be exponential solution. The same as here and the other one just choose the uh, non-negative boundary data and non-manage, then you have a maximum principle to maintain the sign condition. And you can solve the any order q u to, to the power n by high order linearization technique to recover to re, to recover the potential q here. So this is the whole story for the high order linearization. Okay, so now I want to talk about the main topic of today is a simultaneous recovery problem, and uh, this is also with uh, Mati, Tony, and uh, Mikko, and uh, we consider the uh, uh, cavity problem. So, which means if you have uh, the boundary domain omega with symphony boundary, and you consider there is a cav cavity dj inside the omega, strictly inside the omega, such that this omega minus dj, omega sin minus dj bar is, is connected. This is quite simple because you, if you have a disjointed domain, you cannot recover the cavity inside the cavity. So, you need to assume omega minus dj to be connected to recover the cavity. And then we consider QJ only lies on the annulus, annulus type domain, omega minus dj, and uh, then the QJ dj to be the DMF for the Dirac problem. And uh, this result also holds for any n or some uh, polynomial type for the nonlinearity. But uh, for the simplicity, I just show square here. And uh, you assume u equals zero on the boundary dj, u f on the boundary omega. So of course, the inverse problem, we can always measure everything on the boundary, but we cannot measure the thing 
in, inside the domain. So you just assume you could, you, you equal to zero to make this one to be a cavity. Then assume the same DM map you can measure on the boundary. As here, sorry, here is not gamma, here's the boundary omega. I, I didn't change. And uh, this is for, but gamma is just boundary omega. And uh, for any sufficient small boundary data on the CC infinity boundary omega, then you can recover D1, the cavity D1 equal to D2, and the Q1 equal to Q2. And the S F D one equal to D2, I call this is D. And the Q1 equal to Q2 in the omega minus D bar is the annulus domain here. And the, how to recover this one? So the same technique is we just do the first narration and the same as before, we can end up with some harmonic function in the annulus domain. And the single boundary data will recover the D1 equal to D2. This is quite known one measurement to uniquely det determine the cavity inside. And the second narration will give you in the annulus domain integral over omega minus D bar, Q1 minus Q2, V1, V2 equal to zero. So the only task is to show these two harmonic function product together in the domain omega, omega minus D bar will be dense again. But the problem is, the extra problem is VJL equal to zero on the boundary DJ. So which means this VL will vanish on the interior boundary D. So we, cannot, we can no longer choose the VL as the exponential solution before because exponential solution can never vanish. But this one, we need to have the vanish on some portion of the boundary, in the interior boundary side. So how to solve this one? So this is quite an early paper, and not, 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 not that early, but it's quite a famous paper for the linearized local current problem by Dosinos and the Carlos and the, the, in 2009. And then they proved the set of product of how, how many functions on the boundary's most domain vanishing on the fixed close proper subset uh, will be dancing L1. And uh, this is uh, by using some kind of called Walter Lehmann lemma and uh, some uh, complex analysis technique, they can prove this is uh, dense. And I think this paper is quite decent and very hard to read, for, at least for me. And uh, after this one, we can recover the coefficient cube in the endless domain. <clears throat> and uh, of course, we can consider more general uh, nonlinearity term like uh, with Mati, we also, also consider the, the XU as a polynomial from K to two to infinity as this term. And uh, later we consider with the uh, Tony Miko and the team, we consider some fractional power for the nonlinear term. So QX, U epsilon value R minus one U. So this term just uh, need to make sure if you have a fractional power here to make this uh, well-defined. So just add epsilon value. In from in this term. So for any fractional number uh, greater than one. And then we'll, we can also recover Q and then we can recover this AK each term by using the high order lin linearization technique. So this is for the elliptic story. And the sum really work. In fact, in this direction, there are so many different uh, also audience. You, you, are, you have been working on this one, like Ali is called Hyunbei. Um, Katia, that's just, you have considered so many equations. And the recently, Lu Shai and uh, Miko, and uh, this is Shi Shiboshi, uh, they, they wrote a paper on archive to study the increases, increasing stability for the semi-linear equation, ju just like uh, uh, where, so it could, I, find it, I found the equation like this, this equation, and you plus some k square u here. And uh, you make the you make the k to be large, so to see the stability. So they sh show the increasing stability. I think just two days ago on archive. If you are interested, you, you can just uh, look for it on archive. And uh, also Laurie, and uh, you consider the similar equation, and also cosine case by uh, Kathleen Ali, Yapa, Katia, and uh, many people. And the Peter Pasa's equation is not well solved, but only solved for under the monotonicity condition by uh, Miko Bastian, uh, Manus, and uh, Tom, Tommy. And uh, for the fractional semantic equation, which means the fractional passing, and uh, Ru Yu and the Lili and myself and on, we study some kind of different type equation for the fractional equation. 
and the semi hyperbolic uh, is quite famous in the area, right? And also semi hyperbolic in the Boseman equation. And I think at least, uh, of course, there are some mathematician I lost. I forgot to list, so I said I want to ap apologize for my missing in advance. So, anyways, so this quite a um, decent area to study. So you can consider many different equations. And also recently, Katia and uh, Tuhin and the Gunther they considered the porous media equation. And the Lidi also considered some fractional porous media. I think it just uh, two, yesterday he posted on the archive. So anyway, so this is uh, some related works for the nonlinear inverse problems. And uh, for them, um, but uh, in fact, for the the most important thing is about linear problem. If we consider linear case, so uh, I, I gave the example is a QJU square, but if you consider QJU square instead of QJU, and uh, if this is just a Laplace, then the problem is still open. But uh, for the fractional case, we just uh, consider the fractional case. So this is why I say the non-local equation will, I just uh, talk a, a bit for this talk. So for the fractional case, when the leading uh, operator is a fractional Laplacian, so you can determine the cavity D. So the, the, same, the same setup, you have the domain omega, you have the cavity D inside, and the, with the same DM map, you can determine the cavity D and the, the surround, surrounding coefficient simultaneously. But as S equal to one, this problem stays open for n greater equal to three. N equal to two, you can apply the Yamamoto and the Yamanomino or Gunther's results for the partial data. But for n greater equal to three, is still open because no one knows about how to apply the. I'm not sure anyone solved the problem, but uh, to my best knowledge, I think no one still solved this problem yet. It's quite a hard problem. So for the fractional case, it helps us to solve the cavity, unique determination, unique determination of the cavity, and the unique determination of the coefficient. And then I want to say one more sentence is about this cavity determination. Only we need one measurement, just one single non-zero f, and uh, we have a major ones. Then we can determine the cavity. Yeah, it's the standard case. Okay. Okay. So let's go into the recent study for the simultaneous recovery for semi-linear hyperbolic equations. And in fact, this technique, not only for semi-linear, also for the linear case. So you can just delete the same line, same line on both periodic and hyperbolic scenes. But uh, for the simplicity, I just uh, tell about the semi-linear case. Okay. Okay, so the semi-linear periodic equation is given by this way. So we, I let, uh, let Q be the domain omega multiplied by zero, TT is greater than zero, some finite number. I didn't consider the infinite cylinder, just consider the finite cylinder in the space time domain. And the sigma is the boundary omega multiplied with zero t is a stand for the lateral boundary, uh, lateral boundary on the parabolic cylinder. And the, in particular, for the parabolic case, we can consider the leading coefficient gamma is a symmetry matrix, depends on both space and the time, x and t here. And the, with the sound suitable regular condition, c21, c2 means. Uh, <clears throat> In, in the space and the time is one. So just a standard parabolic regularity. X is the first variable, T is the second variable. So C2 is for the X variable, C1 is for the time variable. So this is just a, some well positive for the parabolic equation. And this will become a symmetric matrix value functions in the whole domain Q bar. So in the whole cylinder, you have a gamma here. And the, we only need to assume the gamma to be the uniform elipticity in the sense of the xt, not only x. I mean, normally, if you consider semi-linear semi parabolic equation or a hyperbolic equation, you always consider the space variable only depends on the x. But in here, you can also consider the time where uh, you can also consider the leading coefficient depends on the time variable. So this is a quite surprising to me, at least to me. and. Uh, this is a semi-linear parabolic equation. It can be written as partial TU minus divergent gamma gradient U multiplied uh, plus some 
some nonlinear coefficient here, x t u. And I will introduce what is x t here later. And uh, due to well positiveness, we need to assume g is h1 0 and f is l2 sigma. So this is quite a low regulatory assumption so far. And uh, so uh, please remember here, gamma can depend on both space and time. And then we consider the coefficient a x t y. So here a x t u, I just rewrite u in terms of the y. I just write the u in terms of y. So x t y from q multiply r t is r, but we can write just zero t the same. Simplify the some growth condition. So like this. So first derivative x t y divided by log one over two y episode of y as y tends to infinity, take limit soup equal to zero. So which means this will be not, this is, this is just like a, uh, will not grow faster than this one. So some growth condition is uh, slower than the one over two log. And the uniformly in the <coughs> space time variable in Q. And then for any G in H1, we can find a super function, this one, and the global, the, and the guarantee the global oil positiveness for this equation. And the global oil positiveness means we don't need to assume the boundary, boundary data if it's to be small or initial data to be small, which is whatever. And you can just prove the oil positiveness by assuming the growth condition on the nonlinear term. So this uh, condition is quite important to prove the global oil positiveness. And then we can define the DMF, later DMF, the same as before from some space E to L2 on the boundary. So F, small f is here on, on the later boundary to its normal derivative multiply with a gamma. So gamma is the leading coefficient, depends on space and time. So this just comes from the standard integration by parts and normal derivative here. And then uh, this notation stands for the matrix product. It's not a, the real derivative. Okay, so this is just for the simplicity right, writing. And this E space is the function space to guarantee the oil positiveness. And the gamma zero is some subset of the boundary omega. And when the, in particular, when f equals to zero, so which means you don't have any boundary input when f equals to zero. And you denote such DMF by uh, and, uh, ag capital Z, uh, up zero. And the, because f is zero, which means you don't force any inputs on the boundary. So this is a standard passive measurements, right? I mean, uh, for the DMF, we will always put some dirty data in the, to measure normal data. But for this case, we didn't put any boundary data. We just put the boundary equal to zero and just measure the, the passive measurements. So this is called the passive, passive measurements for the, uh, this semi, for this semi-linear parabolic equation. So by using these passive measurements, what can we do? In fact, we can recover the initial data. If we know A, satisfy this gross condition. The first, this, con this condition is important. If A satisfies this gross condition, and uh, we have uh, the boundary data, lateral boundary data equal to zero, and we don't know the initial data, then we can have the conditional stability for the initial data by using just passive measurements. And the conditional stability, stability says for any positive number, if you have a G1 minus G2 in the H1 sense, that's equal to this number N, you can find some constant C in the delta such that G1 minus G2 in the L2 square, and that's equal to some constant multiplied to passive measurement difference minus some constant in, in the upstairs and the divide by logarithmic delta zero, uh, the difference between the DMF. And the, this minus term, because you see delta zero is between zero and the one, and the S, these two DMF are sufficiently small, this term will be minus infinity. So this will be one over plus infinity. So this will be super small, this will be super small. So this term will give you the uniqueness of the initial data if you have the same DMF. So this is quite simple to see the un uniqueness by using these passive measurements. And the passive measurements is also one measurement results. You just, uh, you didn't put any, in, any later boundary data, you just make the boundary data to be zero and uh, measure the corresponding DMF, that's all. But uh, you need to assume you know A 
this co this coefficient a priori. So you cannot recover A at this moment. Okay. So how to prove this one? And I want to say about the, a bit uh, a, a bit of the idea for the proof. So the lemma is based on the inverse source problem for the condition, uh, conditional stability for the inverse source problem. So if you have the give any positive number and uh, you have the major g h one known and f l two known, less than equal to n. So what's the g? What's the capital f here? So you consider a linear, same. You consider a linear periodic equation, and the gamma also space time dependence, the same as before. And the f is a source here. So you have a bounded source f l two, not bounded sorry. Uh, you have a source in L2, it's bounded by N. You have this, uh, initially a G is bounded by H1 in the N here. And the, the estimates can give you this two, this, this estimates, just uh, the same form, the same form as, as before. Some constant difference of DMF and uh, some constant divided by some logarithmic of the DMF, the pace measurements. So the same, some constant divided by some uh, multiplied with something normal data and the sum constant divided by some logarithmic of the boundary data. And the here, F and the partial mu U, the norm is given by FL2 and the partial mu U on the boundary L2. So this is the condition, conditional stability for inverse source problem. And the, how to connect this lemma to the previous results? In fact, it's quite all, uh, straightforward. You just subtract these two U1, 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 G1, U2, 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 G, U2, G2. You just subtract these two equations. And uh, you can get you can get the difference on the AXT. But A, A is known before. So you have AXT U1 minus AXT U2. Then you can use the mean value theorem for the integration version. And uh, just uh, have uh, the U also here. What is U? U is U1 minus U2. Then the uh, then you can use this you can just uh, subtract two nonlinear equation. Then this term by using the uh, minimal theorem will give you a linear term for the difference of the solution. Then this will become this term. And the source f is zero, so subtraction f equal to zero. So there's no f term here. So everything is measured on only on passive measurements for this term. So once you have this lemma, then you can prove this conditional stability for the initial data. But the main task is how to prove this conditional stability for the inverse source problem for the linear case. And in fact, this proof is not, quite, is not simple. We need to use two different type of column estimates and to introduce some weight functions to prove the previous lemma. And the, the nonlinear term A is not a priori with the Gordian because we need to confirm the condition AX in some suitable space. I didn't write here, XT is in L infinity, but uh, with, with that gross condition, we can show this this, uh, this holds for the, such kind of condition. And this is too much details, so I don't want to talk too much about this. So the sketch proof is just a uh, very simple by using the memory theorem, but the problem is how to prove this, this lemma. This lemma is quite hard for me to prove. Anyways, so this is the conditional stability for the initial data, okay? And uh, if A, so next question, because the previous result is if A is non, A is, A is non a priori, so we, did, we don't need to recover A first. But if A is unknown, we cannot use the passive measurements to determine the all unknowns. So we also prove a theorem that also just for gamma is a space dependence. We don't prove for, for spin, if you find it, if you found a common example for the space dependence leading coefficient, of course, this is also the same for the space time dependence. So this is symmetry uh, and the same by the gross condition for the AJ coefficient and the GJ is H1. And uh, also you denote this as a passive measurement. Uh, this zero denotes by this is zero. You don't put any boundary data by your hand. Then you can find the two unknown sources such that they are not the same, but their passive measurements are the same. This is just a handle computation. But we have the non unique results. If the passive measurements are the same, we cannot recover both initial data and the, and the coefficient. 
if A is unknown. Okay. So again, but if if the coefficient is unknown, I should change the notation A to B here. Because we introduce another nonlinear term is as a before as a polynomial. So some uh, we introduce B J X T Y. Uh, it's a sum coefficient b k x t, and oh here's a sum subin is j. I forgot to write, and the y k. So this polynomial type for the infinite sum, and the, when g j the initial data are small, bound data are small. So as before, as the elliptic case, in order to prove this type of the well positiveness, we can only prove the local well positiveness, and the, to prove the local well positiveness, we need to assume the smallest condition for the inputs in the initial data. So if the initial data is small in, in some in suitable functional space, and the, the boundary data are also small in the in, in some suitable function space, and the, with the active measurements, so which means active measurement means you put you can decide what is the data at your hand. So if the DM map are the same on the boundary, and for any f in the some holder space, then you can recover g1 to g2 and the b1 to b2 simultaneously. So how to prove this one? The idea is also quite straightforward. And then we're just subtracting the same equation because, it, because this is active measurements F. So we can control F to be zero first. So we, we consider another solution, U, U maybe U zero as the boundary data is zero. We cannot control the initial data. We cannot control the uh, lower the coefficient, but we can only control here. So we assume F equal to zero and the, right, this uh, is uh, another solution. And the length we subtract this equation, original equation, with the zero boundary data, then the initial data will be annihilated, will be canceled out. So after this step, the initial data will disappear. So the main target is to recover the coefficient first. And the, after we delete the initial data g, then apply the same as the case, the higher order narration with suitable situ solution for parabolic case, we can recover B1 XT U10. So this U10 is then for the boundary to be zero and the B2 XT U20. We can only recover till this stage, B1 XT U10 to B2 XT U20. This is not, not for the B1 XT Y equal to B2 XT Y, right? Because U10 and the U20 may not be the same at this moment. Because U10 and the U20 are the solution for this equation with F equal to zero. They have, a, they have a different uh, G, G1, G2, and they have a different uh, here. So you cannot say they are the same in, the, in, this, in, in this stage. But, uh, we, but with this condition, with the convergence condition, I mean, suitable condition means the, the summation, if the summation is a convergence, it's convergent. So with this suitable condition for B1, B2, we just subtract B1, xt u10 and the b2 xt u20 divided by u10 u20 and uh, we assume if they are not the same just the form if they are the same just a derivative for something and uh, this term can be easy see certified this equation so w equal to u10 minus u20 and uh, this will be the leading coefficient because w is this term and uh, you can cancel out the the term here right so you can solve w to be a linear parabolic equation with the zero boundary data and the initial one will not be zero, initial to g1 minus g2. So you see this form, so you can apply again zero boundary data with initial data. So you can just re re reapply the conditional stability for the passive measurements, you see the boundary is zero. So you apply the passive measurements for the this uh, conditional stability, then you can recover g1 equal to g2. And the g1 equal to g2, which means this equation w1 must be w must be zero. So u1 zero equal to u2 zero. So they are the same. And the b1 and the b2 we assume is analytic in the y coefficient. So they, they are the same. So this is a whole story for the proof for the simultaneous determination for the periodic case. Okay, so this idea of, of proof. Of course, there are so many details, but uh, I just uh, want to explain the main ideas and the logic, how to play these games. Okay, so last part for the semi-linear hyperbolic equation. In fact, this part is quite similar to the semi-linear parabolic equation. And we consider 
uh, hyperbolic equation, u t t minus divergent sigma greater than u plus some nonlinear term here, and the u to h on the boundary, and then you have a two initial data. One is the displacements, the other is the velocity, right? So for the hyperbolic equation, you have this initial data, you have the boundary data, you have the coefficient sigma. And the sigma, we only assume sigma equals sigma x. We, we, we don't know how to prove sigma depending on time or not. So, so we just assume sigma is a space dependence and time, de time independent. And uh, we also assume sigma signify some condition like this. And uh, this is quite important in the hyperbolic setting because in the hyperbolic setting, we, uh, I want to recall one thing. In the hyperbolic setting, in the hyperbolic setting we can prove some, such conditional stability uh, for free, for the free, for free, the means like give any positive number, then you can prove some kind of the conditional stability for the inverse source problem. But uh, for the hyperbolic case, you cannot prove this one initial data if you don't assume extra condition here. And this is some, somehow called the GCC condition, geometrical control condition. And uh, which means you have a, a given layer and you need to make the wave achieve that layer along the geodesic. Uh, roughly speaking, it's like that. So you need, you need to control the wave in, in the sense. So this kind of characterize about GCC condition in the quantitative version for the leading coefficient sigma here. It's not the only simple ellipticity, but also you need to have some extra function, the passive extra function here. And there's some, some extra coefficient here. This looks like ellipticity, but this is not the ellipticity at all. This is just a, for the control, control part. And uh, also we assume the nonlinear turn has some growth. Also the growth is the same as a logarithmic, one over two logarithmic. And uh, now we measure the past measurements on this portion. And this portion cannot be arbitrary because when it, you need to receive the wave. You need to make the wave reflect in the TO, the part you can receive. So this is quite important condition for the uh, gamma zero for the partial data for the for the partial portion on the boundary. So in, in the hyperbolic case, it's not the everything you need to confine a bit. It's not it's not the, for the free. And the, when the coefficient is just harmonic, you uh, sorry, when the coefficient is harmonic, you can just choose the passive function as a distant function, square of distant function, and the x zero is outside of the domain. And just uh, this one is just uh, the uh, some front face and the norm, uh, in the product greater than zero, so it's in the right. You, you can just image it. What's the picture for this one? So to the time limitation, I want to accelerate a bit. So then, with all the condition, with the course condition and with the uh, GCC condition on the sigma, you can consider the hyperbolic equation in this way. And also the same idea for the hyperbolic equation or the parabolic equation are the same. First, you, you, try, you are trying to solve the linear version for the inverse source problem for the uh, stability condition for the initial data. And this is called the observability condition in the literature, other observability estimates for the hyperbolic, for the linear hyperbolic equation. So for this one, you have the initial data. Initial data can be controlled by some constants, multiply some uh, leading some some coefficient over the term and the multiply uh, multiply with some uh, normal data on boundary plus on source source k capital k here. So this, this looks quite similar to the parabolic case, but uh, in order to derive such inequality, you need to assume sigma satisfies such kind of condition. This is quite complicated, and uh, also for me, but not for the may not for the hyperbolic guys. Okay. So with this condition, you can derive the observability estimate. Then also you can image the same story will appear again. Then you are trying to kill the unknown initial again and uh, trying to recover initial. So the full story and the stability for the initial data by passing measurements, you can prove again. By the nonlinear turn and uh, you have the data boundary equal to zero, you have the unknown initial data. Then you can use the path measurements, which means the later boundary is zero, and you just measure the DMF here. And then this estimates is nothing but applying this one because k is a source term. So this equation right hand side is zero, so there is no k, there is no source term. And then this equation, this is just a, a Neumann data for the zero Dirichlet data here. So this is the path measurements for the right hand side. 
but you, you need, I want to mention again, this sigma, you need to safeify such, such kind of condition there. And then with this at hand, if you have the same passive measurements for the hyperbolic case, you have the same initial data by using the observability uh, estimates. So this is a story for the hyperbolic case. And uh, for the semi-metric recovery for the, this is also, uh, we wrote a paper in the, on the archive. If F is unknown, also the same as the parabolic case, we cannot approve the uniqueness by using the passive measurements. But when the F is some kind of like a power, uh, sorry, polynomial expansion, infinite, infinite many sum, and the, you can recover initial data in the, the lower order coefficient simultaneously. And the, the idea that is the same, you put the boundary to be zero and the subtract to, to cancel out the initial data and the trying to recover the coefficient first. And the after that, you just uh, subtract two equations and uh, use the passive measurements to control the initial data, both initial data, like, like this, control the both initial data. And then once you determine the both initial data, you can completely recover the nonlinear term. So this is the full story as the semi-linear parabolic or semi-linear hyperbolic equations. Okay, so in conclusion, the whole story for the unique, unique determination is based on the products of how many functions or some super solutions. And the, for the semi-linear equation, we have a very simple reconstruction formula. And the recently, Mikoli wrote a paper for the increase in stability as well. And the open problem still, uh, for, open problem can be studied for the nonlinear or non-local settings. It depends on the different models. And uh, in fact, we just found the, not just, we found the quite a long time, non-linearity and non-locality are beneficial to solve the inverse problems. And uh, in fact, I just talk everything about the non same linear case, but uh, with unknown initial data or low order coefficients, we can also study the linear version, which means, which means you consider this a QJ, UJ, and the in initial unknown, you can still recover. And uh, for the linear case, the benefit is you don't need to assume any smallest condition because for the linear case, you have the willfulness at hand. So this is just uh, the whole framework for my today's talk. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ishan, for the very, very nice talk. Are there any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions or comments? Okay, I, I have just uh, one small question. Uh, you mentioned about recovery of cavities for this fractional Laplacian case, right? Yes. Uh, but could you please say a few words, I mean, about the techniques, I mean, which are used to recover, right? Probably it's based on some unique continuation stuff. Uh, oh, you, you mean this one? Uh, this one. A fractional. So the main point is about the, <clears throat> you need to prove the ring approximation in the annual domain. So in the, uh, here's omega minus dj. I forgot to write dj here. So you need to apply the ring approximation for given f outside of the region and the zero in, in, in the annulus. And then you can control the solution in the annulus. So this is standard ring approximation for the fraction of Yeah, for the coefficient. But for cavity, other thing, I mean, just a cavity is just one measurement. It's the very classical case. And you have a uniqueness of the solution, then one point zero, and you have a neighborhood is zero, and then everything will be zero, and contradiction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are, are there any other questions or comments, please? Any other questions or comments, please? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Yishan, for the very, very nice talk. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.